Nowadays, we take colors for granted, but historically, they've been hard to come by. Pigment makers have gone to great lengths to find new hues, and many paints have pretty weird origins. Even today, we're still looking to broaden our paint palette. Meanwhile, we're exploring entirely new approaches to paint making that don't even involve pigments at all. From our distant past to our not-too-distant future, here are 10 of the weirdest paints that we could find, and we're listing them in chronological order. Number 10. Han Purple Purple has long been associated with luxury, not least because of its rarity in nature. Tyrian, or Phoenician purple, is painstakingly extracted from sea snails, which are boiled for days in lead vats, and it was so heavily restricted to the elites of ancient Rome that even the word purple became synonymous with the emperor, hence the saying, donning the purple for becoming the ruler of Rome. It wasn't until 1856 that a chemist finally stumbled, by accident, upon a synthetic alternative, which, according to the fashion of the time, he called mauve. Immediately, it was seized upon by the rich and famous. Purple was similarly exalted in the East. Han purple was no less synonymous with nobility in ancient China than Tyrian purple in ancient Rome. But this Chinese purple was a pigment, not a dye, and it had a far less variable hue. It is thought to have been created as early as 800 BC, but the most famous examples of its use date back to around 220 BC. This is when it was used to paint the terracotta army and murals in the tomb of the first emperor. After that, it disappears from the historical record entirely. It wasn't until the 1990s that scientists synthesized a new batch, the first in almost 2,000 years. The process to make the copper barium silicate pigment was so intricate, though, that they couldn't believe it was discovered by accident. They concluded that the Chinese must have been taught it. For one thing, it involved the grinding of precise quantities of various materials, and for another, it required heating to between 900 and 1,100 degrees Celsius. But it differed substantially enough from Egyptian blue to rule out cross-cultural knowledge sharing. Perhaps since it contains barium, and purple was a byproduct of the glassmaking process which was discovered by Taoist alchemists trying to synthesize white jade. This would certainly explain its appeal to the immortality-obsessed Qing Shi Huang in particular. This was because white jade was linked to health and longevity. In any case, there's more to hand purple than meets the eye. Researchers have found that under certain conditions, temperatures close to absolute zero and magnetic fields higher than 23 Tesla, i.e. more than 800,000 times that of Earth's, the pigment it loses a dimension. Magnetic waves travel along two-dimensional planes within the material instead of propagating three-dimensionally. This was a surprising discovery, intriguing for quantum physicists and, according to some others, potentially explaining how our reptilian overlords shapeshift and how interdimensional travel might work. There are crazy people out there. Always remember that. Number 9. Carmine Red The first ever pigment may have been ochre, clay-rich in reddish hematite. It was this widely available substance that allowed our prehistoric ancestors to leave behind cave paintings that lasted for millennia. It's still used as a pigment today, in fact, but since the Paleolithic era, we found other sources of red – cinnabar, madder, and vermilion, just to name a few. A resin lacquer known as sandarac or dragon's blood, which it was thought literally to contain, was also popular in the Middle Ages. It was used for painting anything infernal, whether the fires of hell, impure blood, demons, or indeed the devil himself. Sometime later, when the Spanish plundered the New World, a new source of red was discovered. Female cochineals, a type of insect that eats prickly pears, were dried by the Aztecs in the mire and crushed to extract red carminic acid or carmine, a red more stable and more intense than any that were known in Europe. Carmine was eagerly lapped up by royalty and artists alike, and it remained in vogue centuries later when it captivated Vincent van Gogh. He said he was very excited by the color, describing it as warm and lively like wine. Carmine is still in use today despite its somewhat grisly origins, not just in paint and dyes, but in cosmetics, shampoos, and even food. As Peter advises in an article labeled, Makeup Enthusiasts Stop Smearing Dead Bugs on Your Face, products containing the pigment may list it as CI-75470, Cochineal Extract, Crimson Lake, or Natural Red No. 4. Despite the popularity of carmine, however, researchers are still on the lookout for a great all-around red, since pigments of this color often lack safety or stability. According to those in the business, the next red could be worth billions. Number 8. Orpiman Orange Throughout history, particularly in the Levant and Asia right up until the 20th century, volcanic orpimon was a major source of orange pigments. Gathered from sulfurous fumaroles, natural gas vents around active volcanoes, the mineral was heated by fire to turn it from yellow to a flaming orange. 
it looks almost golden, which is actually how Orpimon got its name. It's from Aurum, Latin for gold, and Pigmentum for color. For this same reason, looking like gold, it captured the attention of alchemists. No surprises. Preparing the pigment was an arduous process. After hand-selecting the crystals and manually removing impurities, the mineral was painstakingly ground to a powder. Any layers that wouldn't come apart had to be twisted and broken by hand. Only then could the powder be chemically separated from the sulfur and heated for use in orange paint. Suffice to say, there was a lot of manual handling involved, which was unfortunate given that it was high in deadly arsenic. Number 7. Mummy Brown In days gone by, the pulverized parts of ancient cadavers were smeared onto skin and even taken by mouth. By the 16th and 17th centuries, ground-up Egyptian mummy flesh, or mummia, was widely available in European pharmacies, as much as aspirin today might be. According to the father of empiricism, Sir Francis Bacon, it was good for the staunching of blood. And Robert Boyle, one of the founders of modern chemistry, noted that it was used to treat bruises. It was also prescribed for headaches, stomach upsets, broken bones, coughs, uterine infections, wounds, hysteria, dysentery, diarrhea, measles scars, general aches and pains, and uh, pretty much everything else. Mixed with a heady concoction of benzoic, black pitch, and poisonous rue, it was also used to treat epilepsy. As genuine Egyptian mummy supplies struggled to keep up with the demand, dealers began to make fakes, treating the corpses of executed convicts with bitumen and leaving them to dry in the sun. The best candidates for counterfeit mummification were eerily specific, and that was young Virginia maidens and 24-year-old men who died a violent death but nonetheless remained in one piece. Fortunately, the practice of eating the dead gradually fell out of favor, not least because of unpleasant side effects like heart and stomach pain, as well as vomiting, stink of the mouth, and possibly even vomiting the plague. But mummia was used as a pigment in paint right up until the 20th century. Known as mummy brown, Egyptian brown, or caput mortem, it produced a cross between raw and burnt umber. It was too variable for many artists' tastes, but the pre-Raphaelites they seemed to adore it, despite not knowing exactly what it was. The English painter Edward Burne Jones was horrified when he found out. No surprises again. Immediately upon being informed, he rushed to his studio and ceremonially buried his tube of mummy brown in the earth. Number 6. Indian Yellow Academics have noted the inherent racism of white European artists using paints mined or manufactured by black and Asian colonial slaves to studiously differentiate these lesser races from their own, especially when those paints contained calpis. Indian yellow, or puri, was popular between the 18th and 19th centuries for recreating browner skin tones. Euphemistically described as organic by exporters, it was assumed to be vegetable in origin. It wasn't until 1883 that its true origin was exposed. According to the civil servant who traced Indian yellow to its source, a village in Bihar, it was no more than just the urine of cows. Collected by milkmen, it was heated over a fire, strained through a cloth, and shaped into balls for drying in the sun. Once the secret was out, the pigment was ultimately banned. It was dirty, unhygienic, and quite possibly toxic as well. But it was also unhealthy for the cows, since in order to get the right shade of yellow, their diet was restricted to mango leaves. Nowadays, Indian yellow is, as you might expect, synthetic. Number 5. Radium Green Glow-in-the-dark paint was all the rage in the 1910s and 20s, but in those days it was made out of radium. This green glowing radioactive element was only discovered by Marie Curie in 1898, so it was still pretty new and exciting, not to mention very misunderstood. Even Curie carried vials of it in her skirt. She thought it was beautiful, and she apparently wasn't alone. 3,000 times more glowy than uranium and over a million times more radioactive, radium-226, the most stable isotope, has a half-life of 1,600 years. It's also extremely rare. When the application of radium salts was found to shrink tumors in the human body, people embraced the deadly element as a panacea for radiant health. It was sold in water, soda, candy, face creams, powders, lotions, and soaps, and it was also added to spa baths. It wasn't until later that people started dying. People apparently back in the day put a whole lot of weird stuff in their body. As the Wall Street Journal reported in 1932 in a story about the steel mogul Eben Byers, the radium water worked fine until his jaw came off. Holy sh! In paint, it was marked under the brand names Undark, Luna, and Marvelite. Originally intended for military watchdogs to help soldiers tell the time in the dark, it soon became fashionable among civilians. Of course, the factory girls who applied the paint to Clark and watchdogs had no idea of its dangers. They were told it was totally safe. 
and safety regs back in the day, not what they are today. These girls basically thought nothing of sucking their brushes to straighten the bristles, getting the dust in their hair and clothes, and they'd even paint their fingernails and their teeth with it. Inevitably, they became very, very ill. One young woman complained of weight loss, joint pain, and feeling like a tired old woman. The following year, her dentist was dismayed to find that her jaw was splintering away, and he was forced to remove it. However, the constant bleeding that followed it killed her a little while later. Anemia and leukemia they became common, and skeletons effectively dissolved. Jaws, hips, ankles, and so on, they simply crumbled away. Those who worked directly with the paints were even carcinogenic themselves, exhaling deadly radon gas. But the factories they refused to accept any blame until the evidence became irrefutable. Although some of the surviving workers, dubbed the Radium Girls by the press, brought lawsuits against the United States Radium Corporation, the company's lawyers stalled for time in a bid to run down the clock on the statute of limitations. Meanwhile, the plaintiffs they could barely walk or talk, let alone work, while living with half of their faces missing. Ultimately, the U.S. Radium Corporation was forced to set off $10,000 to each victim, along with a $400 a year pension and full medical care for the rest of their short and agonizing lives. Number 4. Singularity Black The whole point of black is the absorption of all visible light so that nothing can reflect to the eye and be seen. So if you've ever seen black paint, then either you didn't really see it or it wasn't really black. True black paint has been virtually non-existent until only very recently when Surrey Nanosystems introduced Vanta Black. This super black uses vertically aligned carbon nanotubes, a billion for every square centimeter, to completely absorb all light. According to creators, the nanotubes are arranged like blades of grass, all sticking upwards on their ends. They have also been compared to a field of wheat in which, instead of the wheat being three or four feet high, it's about a thousand feet tall, very, very long compared to their diameter. Light enters and the photons can't escape, bouncing around inside until they're absorbed and dissipated as heat. Even ultraviolet and infrared are captured in this way. When the human eye looks at Vanta Black, there's nothing whatsoever to be seen. Although the spray paint version, known as Vanta Black SVIS, has a more random spaghetti like arrangement of nanotubes and therefore absorbs less light, it's only infrared that escapes, and, well, that's invisible to us anyway. Painting with Vanta Black is basically subtractive. Even the contours of three dimensional objects are lost, and so all that's left is a seemingly two dimensional silhouette, as though your vision itself has been photoshopped. The designer Anish Kapoor was so entranced by the paint that he bought exclusive rights to its use, effectively banning other artists from using it. It's the blackest material in the universe after black holes, he said. This, by the way, is not correct. Unfortunately, all he's used it for so far is a fairly mediocre men's watch, which he priced at $90,000. In his defense, though, Vanta Black is not so much a paint as a proprietary process relying on Surrey Nanosystems equipment, so all he's really done is contracted the lab to do some of his work. But Singularity Black is another nanotube paint that anyone can purchase for use. Made under contract for NASA, it actually predates Van der Black. It's not quite as good, and it's capable of dissolving through the skin, but at least it's available, or at least it's available if you can afford it. $525 buys enough to coat just nine square inches. Number three, Birth Pink. This paint name for the hexadecimal color code 223173179 was actually devised by AI. The algorithmic neural network came up with ghastly pink for 2311371655 and cold of tail for 2221201174. Beside the pinks, it also dubbed a kind of washed out teal, stoner blue, an ominous bloody color, farty red, and a buffish tortilla just as turdly. The AI in question had been fed a list of 7,700 Sherwin-Williams paint colors in the RGB hexadecimal format and was tasked with analyzing the data for rules to name the colors on its own. You can't buy birth pink just yet, but if it's pink you're after, you might want the pinkest of the pinks out there. In response to Anish Kapoor's Van der Black hoarding, paint maker Stuart Semple released a new pigment of his own, the world's pinkest pink, and specifically banned Kapoor from ever using it. In an undeniably classy comeback, Kapoor Instagrammed a photo of his middle finger coated in Semple's pink pigments with a caption that read, Up yours, hashtag pink. While we're on the topic, it's worth noting that some claim pink doesn't even exist. We don't see it in rainbows, they say, which means no band of wavelengths mix red and violet. This, of course, would make pink even rarer than black, but others just say they're talking rubbish and that all colors are simply inventions of the brain. Still, it's an interesting factoid nonetheless. 
Number 2. Bioluminescent Blue In 2016, an Australian gallery showcased a number of works that use bioluminescent blue paint. The solution contains the marine bacteria Ali Vibrio fischeri not sure if the pronunciation on that one's correct, whose natural glow the Hawaiian bobtail squid uses to camouflage its shadow when it's hunting. However, the paintings, which included images of a viperfish, the moon, and for some reason Donald Trump, were basically painted blind. Since the nutrients on the agar dishes that served as each canvas could only support the bacteria for a time, the bioluminescence of colonization had to coincide with the exhibition's opening. When the solution was being applied, it effectively was like invisible ink. Unfortunately, these were weren't promoting new paint so much as a way of testing antibiotics. Aficieri glow when they're alive, so a lack of glow means they're dead. However, we could see bioluminescent paint becoming more commonplace in the near future. Bioluminescent plankton, for instance, are known to emit a glow when disturbed, hence the blue illumination on some tides. It's thought these organisms may be co-opted as a low-impact, low-cost way to light up the cities of the future. If so, we may see them on buildings in lamps and even in streetlights. First, though, researchers will need a way to make them glow without disturbance. In the meantime, there's Stuart Semple's glowiest glow pigment, Blue Lit, made from some of the planet's finest light-emitting pigments and rare earth activators, which is according to the artist's website. Number 1. Wall Smart White this one's just a concept for now, listed among the likes of Google Nose, a nanosensor-based smell augmentation device, energy belts, which converts fat into energy to charge a cell phone, and the Latro lamp, an automatic light powered by a CO2-consuming algae. But the WallSmart idea is actually pretty feasible. Loaded with nanoscale LEDs, it's a paint that changes color on demand. Once on the walls, it would in theory be controlled by an app, the WallSmart app. You could use it to change the color of your walls for an occasion, or simply set the color to change for the time of day or how you're feeling. It's not clear what color they would be by default or what they'd be with the system turned off, but white seems like an obvious choice. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do give us a thumbs up below. Don't forget to subscribe. Brand new videos just like this every day of the week. For more from me, why not check out my other channel today I found out, which is linked to below. And as always, thank you for watching.